Alrighty, and I think that should be all for the logistics end, Ria, over to you. Okay, so hello everybody. Um, if you've been here for the past two events, I'm the same host, but for those of you who are new, I'm Ria, and I am the OMS Logistics Lead for Simply Neuroscience. So I have the honor of introducing Dr. Sanyub Gua. Uh, today we'll be giving a presentation on modeling Alzheimer's disease in tiny nematoid species. Um, so, Dr. Goh was born and raised in Calcutta, India, where he did his undergrad studies. Then in 2008, he moved to California, where he completed his master's in biological sciences from California State University, East Bay. After that, he moved to Singapore, where he worked as a research associate at the National University of Singapore. Then he moved to Barcelona in 2011, um, where he did his PhD on neuroscience from Pompey Fabra University. And after that, he returned back to California, where his postdoctoral research was at the Buck Institute with, with Professor Copy, 2016, on aging and neurodegenerative disease. After that, he moved to the University of Rochester, upstate New York, to continue his research on Alzheimer's disease by working at the labs of Professor Keith Nirk and Gail Johnson, 2019, as a staff scientist. Fun fact about him is that as a globetrotter, he did his higher studies from three different countries, lived in seven different cities, and can speak five languages. Um, so without further ado, thank you to Dr. Go for coming here, and take it away. Yeah, thank you, Ria, for introducing me. Yeah, so that was a very nice introduction. So I was also present in Dr. Uh, Simon Rego's talk. So my talk will be completely different from what you have uh, heard before or seen before. So basically I will take you to very basic translational styles to like what we exactly do inside the laboratory settings with like top-notch instruments, apparatus, confocal microscope systems and everything. So whenever you get to listen from a like an actual physician perspective, you don't get to hear from them like what are the exact mechanisms that causes a disease. All they talk about, okay, like these are the different medicines, these are the treatments, like this is how a patient will get better. But exactly what happens inside a patient's body, they sometimes uh, try to overlook them. It's not like purposefully they do that. It's just like they don't go in deep into that. So our, as a research scientist, our job is like to understand all the molecular mechanisms as well as the genetic aspect behind the disease, how can we target any pathological hallmarks by using different model organisms? So again, I speak about model organisms, like obviously not, it's not, for us, it's not readily available all the different human disease brain, right? So for that, we use certain genetic model organism, be it worms, flies, mice, rats, et cetera, to mimic certain disease, and then we do our experiments on them so that that becomes a very good drug target and eventually we move into the humans. So I will take you uh, a tour of the different molecular mechanisms that are involved in the Alzheimer's disease. First, let me share my screen. Can you see that? Uh, yeah, we can. Okay. Yeah, although the Ria introduced me, but these are some of the places I have been uh, before. Like this is uh, where I did my undergrad from back in India. And then I did my master's from Cal State University in Isla, California. And then I moved to Barcelona in Spain for my PhD and then returned back to California where actually I met Chin Mai. She was also doing her intern over there. And then now finally I'm here in University of Rochester where I'm um, working on staff scientists. So this is my, the title of my talk, like modeling Alzheimer's disease in tiny nematode species C. elegans. So basically, as I was saying, like we have in our laboratory, like different model, uh, model organisms, like be it worms, be it mice, be it rats or fruit flies even. So with which, with the help of which we understand different molecular aspects of a disease. For example, as I said, like it's not always easy to work with the human disease brain, but obviously the research never stops, right? So in the meantime, we use these model organisms, try to model a disease, and then obviously we can use them as a um, drug screening platform. So the outline of my talk, as I mentioned, like our lab is mainly interested in working on Alzheimer's disease. And uh, Dr. Rego talked about different hallmarks. So in our case, the main key hallmark that we focus on is tau protein. 
and also the different modifications of that and how we can actually mimic such a complex disease in a tiny model uh, organism called C. elegans that I will go through uh, with all of you. What are the different pathological phenotypes we can actually observe in this model system? And then more deep into the cell, like inside the neuron, what exactly happens? Like when we talk about a neuron, the first cellular organ that comes in our mind is mitochondria, right? So exactly what are the different mitochondrial phenotypes that we can also observe in this model system with the help of different biosensors. I will also talk about that. And finally, I will uh, give a uh, overview of the working model as well as the conclusion of my project. And the main thing, uh, what I want from you guys, like after, uh, after my talk gets over, I want to leave the platform open for any kind of questions, be it like, on the project itself or be it like career wise or any other scientific stuff that you want to ask me. Okay, so Alzheimer's disease, like everyone heard about that, right? Like it's like the most common and most severe neurological disorder affecting millions of people worldwide. And it's also the most uh, uh, common form of dementia. The, the main pathological hallmarks of a patient it when it happens is like the progressive loss of memory, cognitive functions and changes in behavior and personality. The greatest risk factor is age, because as we know, as a person gets older, they have a higher risk of having that disease, which is very unfortunate. And so far the ratio is like 10% of individuals over 65 have this, whereas 35% of the people over 85 years have this. And as you can understand, like they, it comes up with a high healthcare cost because unfortunately, again, like there's no drug or therapeutic agent to prevent or cure this disease. So this was the thing I was uh, telling all of you before, like when the doctors or physicians talk about this, they don't talk about the exact molecular mechanism because it's quite complex. And this is very true in case of Alzheimer's disease. Like although the research has been conducted for over 20 years or so more than that, still there is no particular like a magic pill that can actually cure that disease. So here we come as a scientist level, like to go into the grassroots of the uh, disease mechanism and try to find out exactly what's happening inside a human brain. Okay. So there are two main pathological hallmarks that I mentioned before, like the one is the formation of senile plaques consisting of the A-beta peptide. So basically it's a clump of protein that gets aggregated inside the human brain, as well as the formation of neurofibrillary tangles, which is formed by abnormally modified tau. So Dr. Ego was talking about biomarkers. So in our case, in our lab, the main biomarker we look or we try to conduct our research on is this modified tau protein. So basically it's like a strings of uh, little proteins that clumps inside the neurons and blocks any synaptic connection. So the question comes like, what is tau? Like all of us have tau is very common protein and very interestingly in normal healthy conditions, it is actually very beneficial for human protein. It conducts various functions. Like for example, it helps in microtubule binding, assembly, and stabilization, it also helps in neuronal development, outgrowth, and also it helps in axon transport and synapses. So you can say like tau is a very beneficial protein in normal healthy conditions. But the problem happens when it becomes pathological. Then what happens like it cannot no longer bind to the microtubules. That's why the, it gets missorted, leading to the disintegration of microtubules, which even finally causes disruption of neural communication and finally synaptic failure and neurodegeneration. So the key, key question that we try to find out in the lab is like why and how such a beneficial protein like tau be, turns into pathological state and causes severe neurodegeneration in the human brain. And it has been found out very recently, in fact, like there have been several post-translation modifications in short we call as PTM, which actually happens in the tau domain structure, which causes alteration of its structure and leads to a change in its function. And when we think of different PTMs, as I said, like the key mains are phosphorylation and acetylation. Obviously there are mention of other modifications on the tau protein as well, but phosphorylation and acetylation are the two major ones that have been found in the human brain. 
And again, tau being a phosphoprotein by itself, it has like over 80 potential phosphorylation sites. Like it can be modified at 80 different places. But out of all those different sites, the key pathological one has been found out as theonine 231. So basically, if the tau protein is present in the human brain, and if it gets modified at this specific site, it can turn to be a severely pathological. Because what it does, it changes the original structure of the protein. It changes its conformation, obviously disturbs the homeo homeostasis, homeostasis, and obviously it affects its function and it all this drives the neurotoxicity. So in our case, as I mentioned, we use C. elegans as a model organism. Why we use that? Uh, I will just mention just brief advantages of that model organism. First of all, it's very easy to maintain, it's very uh, cost susceptible, it's very economic. It has a very short life cycle, like the whole life cycle of a C. elegans can be completed within one month. So imagine like if you're doing multiple experiments, be it for a summer project or be it for your PhD thesis, you can, this model organism is the best because all the experiments can be done in a very short time frame. And it's an excellent tool for medical uh, genetic analysis. So interestingly, all the human genes, they have like over 80% orthologs in the C. elegans system as well. So if you are working on a specific gene in human, you can easily find out that same gene in the C. elegans system and you can knock it out and look for different pathological phenotypes. And in our case, since we are talking about Alzheimer's disease, a neuronal disease, it has a good nervous system consisting of 302 neurons and 50 glial cells. And the most important uh, thing, and that probably you guys also heard like in, from, in terms of different therapeutic companies, they also use this as a model organism because it is an excellent tool for doing any kind of drug screening assays. So this is how they look like in a laboratory setting. They grow on a petri plate or an agar plate. And as I said, uh, mentioned, like they have like a couple of larval stages and then they go into adult and that also lays eggs and then this cycle continues. So in our case, since we are talking about Alzheimer's disease, which I said like uh, is an age related disease. So most of the experiments we do in uh, older animals. So what we do is like since C. elegans doesn't have an endogenous tau by itself. So first of all, like since we are working on the tau protein with the help of microinjection, we specifically integrate the wild type copy of human tau into its body. And then with the help of CRISPR-Cas9 technology, we modify certain pathological sites. If you mention, I'm, uh, if you remember, I mentioned threonine 231 as the main pathological site. So what we do, like we, we converted threonine to glutamic acid at that particular position, and that mimics the phosphorylation in the C. elegans system. So in our, all our, in all my slides later on, you will find T231E, which is basically our main pathological mutant strain. And once we have this, we obviously conduct different experiments to mediate different pathological phenotypes. So this slide is very important. So basically, these are the main key strains that we are working with in the lab. First of all, the wild type strain, which doesn't have any kind of tau, it's like no tau in it, just a normal wild type, wild type strain. And then we have the wild type tau uh, copy strain that is tau T4. And this, as I mentioned, T231E, our main pathological mutant. And also, as you know, like in when you do experiments, there's a very high importance of having a negative control. So we have a tune into alanine substitution, which basically blocks any kind of phosphorylation and that access of phosphonal and T231 is our A is our negative control. So this is the main pathological mutant and this is the corresponding control for that. And most importantly, we limited the expression of the tau in the specifically six mechanosensory neurons in the animals. So this is how it looks like on a, on the specific confocal microscope. So if you imagine this is the head of the worm and this is the tail of the worm. So this mechanism say neurons run across the worm's body and our tau is expressed specifically in those uh, six neurons. So once all these strains are optimized in our lab, we conduct various experiments to model our human uh, Alzheimer's disease. For example, we do neurodegeneration assays, we check their lifespan, we check their behavior. And as I said, like we also go deep inside into the neuron to check into the mitochondria and other lysosomes and other organs as well. So I will go step by step into all of those. So as I said, like we, to start with, we worked with, uh, we, the first assay we did was the neurodegeneration assay. 
And in the cartoon, you can see like this is the one first anterior neuron, and this is the another posterior neuron where our tau is expressed. So this is how it normally looks in a wild type worm. Okay, so in normal like healthy worm, these two neurons they don't overlap with each other, and that's why they can divide the worm's body into two distinct mechanosensory fields. So this is the anterior mechanosensory field, and this is the posterior mechanosensory field. And with the help of our entry marker, you can see like we can see there are two distinct neurons which are spread apart from each other. Interestingly, when we have this pathological tau mutant, we see a distinct overlap between the two neurons. And as we age the worms older, we can see severe neurological phenotypes. For example, we see branching in those neurons. We see a misguidance in the neuron, like a waviness. We see formation of beads or dot-like structure in the neuron. And also we see a certain breakage in the neuron itself. So we can say like when we have this modified tau protein expressed in these neurons, it can cause or it drives different neurotoxicity. And interestingly, in some animals, we can even see multiple uh, defects all at the same time. And also when the worms get even older, like probably comparing to the human age of 80 or older, we can even see a complete neuronal loss. And so once we have, so the, to summarize this whole slide, we can say like when we have this modified tau mutant in these neurons, it causes different pathological phenotypes in terms of neuronal structural abnormalities. Okay, so the next question, uh, and then what we do, the next part is like quantify, like how many of these animals show all these kind of defects. So in red, our pathological tau mutant, and these are the corresponding controls, like be it normal tau wild type or the ablation. And in all those cases, you can see the phosphomimetic has comparatively significantly higher defects as, rest of, as compared to the rest of the controls. So the next question that comes in our mind, okay, we see this kind of uh, neuronal abnormalities in, in terms of morphology. Does it causes any kind of functional defect or not? So these uh, neurons are responsible for sensing any light touch on the worm. So basically if you touch the worm on the anterior side, it will mediate a backward locomotion response. So this is how it will look like. So basically you touch the anterior portion of the head portion of the worm, and once it senses the touch, it goes in the posterior direction. So since we saw our morphological abnormalities in those neurons, we wanted to see whether this functional assay, touch assay is working in these worms or not. And interestingly, to collaborate with the previous data here, also see our phosphomatic worms, they are severely touched not sensitive as compared to the rest of the controls, where controls like almost 90% of them are able to sense the touch, whereas our phosphomimetic strain are severely touch uh, sense defective. And as I said before, like one of the main uh, hallmark that we wanted to see is like whether there is formation of any tau aggregates specifically in these neurons or not. So as you can see, this is the ablation mutant, our negative control. The cell body, if you think this is the cell body and this is the long axon in the neuron, and this is the nucleus right circular in the middle, there is no presence of any aggregates in the control worm. But interestingly, in our T231E mutant, we see severe aggregates all around the nucleus in the cell body. And more interestingly, like as the worms get older, we see these aggregates even clumping up together like that we normally expect in a human brain that we also can visualize in a tiny model system in the same neural settings. So as I mentioned, like we do our experiments at multiple ages of the life cycle, at day three, at day 10, and there's a stark contrast in terms of the amount of aggregates and their sizes present in the cell body. This is mentioned over here as well. Okay, to summarize so far, what I have shown you, like when, uh, when the worms have this kind of modified tau mutants, they show this kind of subtle but robust and reproducible phenotypes. They progress with age and they're restricted to pathological mutant. Like only our phosphomimetic strain is showing these phenotypes, but not any on the control uh, strains. 
So the next key question is like, why? Like, what is the big question or big backlog, uh, back, black box in between having this phosphonematic strain and why it is called causing these neuronal deficits? And since we are talking so much of the neurons, the first key organ that comes in our mind is mitochondria, because as we know, the neurons are rich in mitochondria and they supply ATP for the neurons to conduct various functions. So there's an obvious reason to see what are the exact uh, mitochondrial health, specifically in those neurons. And it has been shown before, like not only Alzheimer's disease, but thinking of any kind of neuro, um, neurodegenerative disorders like Parkinson's or ALS, whenever there is a mitochondrial dysfunction, be it like reduction of mitophagy or reduction in the transport, causing higher amount of ROS, it all causes to causes neurodegeneration and which becomes the backbone of any kind of neurological disorders. So the obvious question comes like when we have this modified tau strains, whether they cause similar kind of mitochondrial dysfunction or not, like be it fragmentation or defect in transport, mitophagy or increased ROS or not. So that was, that was the next question that we wanted to answer. And for that, we use a specific fluorescent reporter called MitoMchyma. MITO stands for mitochondria, M stands for men, uh, monomeric. So basically this is a pH sensitive fluorescent protein, which means that it changes its color depending upon the pH of the medium. So if you think pH is like acidic below five, it will give you a red color. If the pH is over seven, it will give you a green color. And it is specifically targeted to the mitochondrial matrix. So depending upon the medium, uh, whether it's acidic or normal, the, uh, the protein will throw its color as well. So with this specific fluorescent protein, we mainly wanted to check what are the dynamics or morphology of the mitochondria in these neurons, whether they're transported normally across the neurons, and what is the mitophagy, whether it also get affected or not. So for example, this is the morphology analysis. I will explain all this as we go into the results section. And interestingly, you can see the mitochondria moving back and forth over here. Like if you think the plump as the cell body, you will see the mitochondria is trafficking across the nearby gland. So that we can also quantify using high, uh, high confocal imaging as well. And also we did mitophagy analysis by quantifying, by doing ratiometric analysis between the green and red channel. But I will explain this step by step. So the first uh, aspect that we wanted to check is the dynamics and morphology of the mitochondria in these specific neurons. And for that, we obviously check the cell body because if you remember the aggregation data, we did saw a lot of aggregation present in the cell body itself. So basically we wanted to check whether the mitochondria is active in those, uh, in those cell body or not. And the different parameters that we quantify is like volume, area, and density of the mitochondria. So the way we do that is like, first we take the image of the cell body and then with the help of image software, we trace the line of the mitochondria our network. So in green, this is the mitochondrial reticular network. So we quantify the, the area of those network and also we quantify the area of the cell body as well. And as I mentioned, like all our assays has been conducted at two different light points. So at day 10, interestingly, we see a severely fragmented mitochondria in the T231E, our pathogenic strain. In the control strain, obviously with age, there will be a certain degree of fragmentation, but in our pathological mutant strain, it seems to be much higher compared to the control. And this is the corresponding uh, quantification. So we have the control strain, the wild type strain, the negative control, as well as our pathogenic mutant. So in both these graphs, you can see like they have decreased mito area as well as the decreased mito density. The next thing we wanted to check like whether they were transported properly across the new right lane because there should be a proper turnover of this mitochondria like the damaged mitochondria should be replaced by a healthy mitochondria. So we wanted to check the transport mechanism as well. And for that, we use another reporter strain called MLSP, MAX7, MLSJP. MAX stands for mechanosensory neuron. 
MLS stands for mitochondria localization signal and GFP, obviously, you guys know, mean fluorescent protein. So this is how the mitochondria in the whole neurite length look like, individual rod uh, tube-like structures. And the two main parameters that we are quantifying from those videos is like whether they're the, the length they run across the neurite as well as their speed. And here also I will show you two videos. So this is the control strain. You guys will see like the dots of the mitochondria. They're nicely trafficked back across the neurite length. And this is a perfect healthy scenario. This is how it should like. They should be like properly transported back uh, and across, across the neurite length. But interestingly, in the control strain that you guys will see now, it seems like the mitochondria are present, no doubt. There's no like a decrement in terms of number of mitochondria, but it seems like they're very stationary. They're not moving at all. So that also a, a key pathological hallmark that we can detect, like why these mitochondria are not moving, why they're just stuck onto one single place. And with the help of our EMERI software tool, we can also quantify different parameters. First of all, we can quantify how many of these mitochondria are moving. As I said, like in terms of the total number of mitochondria, there were no difference. Only the motile mitochondria, the ones that are, uh, the mitochondria that are moving are significantly lesser compared to all the control strains. And then, as I said, like we can also quantify the run length as well as the speed of this mitochondria as well. And in both cases, we see there is a huge decrease compared to the rest of the controls. And here also with the image, we can do different primograph plots. So the zigzag line indicates like the very, uh, very motile mitochondria that you expect in a control strain, whereas this stationary line indicates like the mitochondria just stuck onto the one, uh, one place and that happens in the pathological tau strain. So the last key phenotype that we wanted to check in terms of the mitochondria is the mitophagy. So obviously all of you guys again know what the mitophagy is like whenever it gets damaged, it gets engulfed by an isolation membrane and then it fuses with lysosome and which goes inside the lysosome to form the mitolysosome and finally it gets degraded and gets back to the cell. So this is also a very dynamic mechanism and should be like always continuously happening like whenever there's a damaged or dysfunctional mitochondria it should be immediately replaced by a healthy mitochondria. So we wanted to check whether this mechanism is also happening properly or not in our pathological tau strain. And for that, we use the M-Climber reporter strain and we take uh, images at different channels. Like this green channel indicates happy and healthy mitochondria, whereas red channel indicates the light mitolysosomes. And then we do our asymmetric analysis between the green and the red channel. So interestingly, at baseline conditions, like when there is no exogenous stress, we didn't see any kind of difference between all the different strains. Like although we saw a defect in the morphology, although we saw a defect in transport, but in terms of the mitophagy, we didn't see any kind of uh, difference between the tau strain and the rest of the controls. Like you can say like there may be a certain uh, drop in terms of the numbers, but it was not statistically significant. So our next question was like, since this was done at a baseline normal condition, what happens when we give the worms some kind of exogenous stress? And for that, we use a very well-known stress inducer called PAPOD. So basically it blocks complex one of the electron transport chain and causes higher amount of oxygen, oxygen species and also depletes membrane potential and also lowers than ATP. So this is a very strong, uh, exogenous stress chemical that we have used. And interestingly, as expected in the wild type normal ones, worms, like this mitophagy shoots up because this is the normal response of the cells. Whenever there is a damage, one mitochondria it wants to get rid of that. And that's why you see a high induction of the mitophagy. But very interestingly in our control strain, very interesting in our control sense, it seems like this mitophagy phenomenon is completely suppressed or blocked. We don't know the exact mechanism behind this. We are exploring different uh, pathways for that. But very interestingly is like, as expected in the control strain, the mitophagy ramps up, but it seems to be completely suppressed in the pathological strain when we induce some kind of stress. And while we are working on the mechanisms, we were also relating any studies in the human uh, aspect or not. 
And interestingly, it has been mentioned before, like this is called like a system overload. Like imagine like you already have a modified tau strain and on top you are giving a toxic chemical. It seems like, a, like the brain cannot deal anymore with that. And that's why it completely shuts down. And that's why the whole pathway of removal of this damaged mitochondria doesn't work properly. And this whole failure of this system is, has been implicated in aging, diabetes, and neurodegenerative disorder. So it is very strikingly for us, like a, such a more tiny model organism, like actually able to replicate what has been shown before in human studies as well. Okay, to summarize, so far all my data, what we can say, like in our lab, we have successfully created a genetic model organism which can replicate some of the disease phenotypes. For example, we saw a deficit in a function as well as morphology. We saw a lot of mitochondrial defects. For example, morphology was affected. We saw the transport was affected. Only stress-induced mitophagy was suppressed, not at baseline, but only stress-induced mitophagy. And that's how we successfully created the disease model in our lab. There have been a lot of publications on this, like last, paper, last year, Although it was a pandemic year, we were uh, productive enough to got like at least three, four articles just based on this project and there are other articles as well. And one of the key studies that we are doing in the lab, like as I speak now, some other people are also conducting this research in the lab. Like now, since we have an established model system where we saw two main pathological phenotypes or the biomarkers, like one is the aggregate, tau aggregates, and also mitochondrial dysfunction. So keeping these two as biomarkers, we are doing a huge drug screening from natural products as well as supplies from the companies to see whether we can simultaneously target these two pathways at the same time, whether we can clear these tau aggregates as well as we can boost up mitochondrial health or not. So once we get that, we can obviously move into different neuronal cell lines or work with different higher model organisms such as rats and mice. And that will lead us the path way to go into the clinical trials. So with that, I'd like to thank both my labs and part with Professor Keith Narke. He, he is the main driving force behind working in the different model organisms and Professor Gail Johnson, and she is the main tau person, like she is a very well-known researcher working in the tau field for almost, I would say like 20 years. And also different, like we have a huge battery of like undergrads, masters, PhD students. So I'm very thankful for all their work. And obviously our funding agency last year, we got a five year, like almost 10 million grant donated for this specific project. So we have enough funding. So if anyone is interested to do any kind of project, feel free to reach out to us. And obviously thanks to the organizer for inviting me and I will be happy to take any questions related to this project or something else. Thank you. I believe Rhea might have stepped aside for a little bit. I need to get some water. Um, so everyone, feel free to drop your questions in the chat for Dr. Aguha. He's happy to talk more about his research or even more generally about his professional career um, and how his research interests have developed over time. So whichever route you would like to ask questions in, please feel free to. We'll give it a couple minutes for everyone to type out their questions. Yeah, I think there are a couple of things on the chat. I don't know whether there is any question. Uh, I think everyone is saying thank you. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Hi, sorry, can you hear me? My um, mic kind of froze. Yeah, we can hear you now. Yes. Mm -hmm. cool. Maybe a question to start us off uh, with is, as you know, Synaptic Hacks participants were all students, mostly high school undergraduate students. And I think it'd be really interesting to hear about how your research interests uh, developed from that high school undergrad level to where you are currently, but more so on like, how did you 
uh, how are you able to explore but also synthesize all of your interests into the career that you're involved in today? Yeah, that's a very good question. So like when you think of like look around the world like and you think of the different diseases that are like that still doesn't have any proper medication and obviously Alzheimer's disease like tops the chart, right? Like we have, thankfully we have these uh, me uh, medicines for cancer or AIDS or other devastating diseases, but still you think of, even for Parkinson's disease, like there's a dopamine therapy as well. But in terms of Alzheimer's disease, there's not been successful uh, medication that had been like, obviously it's, there's something over the counter drugs like that can actually like maybe stop the disease uh, progression, but it cannot completely cure it. So that's why our lab or the people working in the lab, we have this one unified interest, like let's find out or let's run after the disease mechanism. Because unless you find out the mechanism of the disease, it's like just throwing balls in the dark, right? It will never hit your target. So that's, that's what we are trying to find out. And that's why we are very fortunate enough that our work so far, knock on wood, has been very productive. And we even got collaborated with the different companies who have shown interest in doing different drug screening assays. And hopefully like if, we, if the work continues as well, like definitely we will try to find out something that can eventually lead up to the clinical trials. So that's our main goal. Like, oh, okay, obviously you've got all these different phenotypes. Now what next is to find out like any specific drugs which can actually cure or uh, rescue all this pathological phenotype. So unless we get those mechanisms, our work will never end. And in that way also, we thank the NIH as well, like for appreciating the work and giving off enough uh, financial benefits like to conduct for at least next couple of years as well. Absolutely, thank you. Um, I think Anisha's question is kind of similar, I believe you covered that a little bit, just project development. Um, maybe even looking more into the future, um, where do you see your research going and let's say 10 years into the future, where do you hope to be at that point? Yeah, 10 years into the future, I would definitely say like we at least find out a couple of drugs that can be helpful for the human mankind because clinical trials will take obviously a couple of years. Like suppose if our work is successful, if our mice also replicates all the data that we have got in our C. elegans system as well, that will probably take like at least one more year. And then depending upon how successful in the clinical trials, it will be also a couple of years. So definitely if we, the success of the whole project, right, will be depend upon the final validation of the drugs that can actually cure the process. So that's until we find that, then the work will always continue. And lucky enough, we have got enough hands to do that. Like it's, I just showed you like one single aspect, which has been like published uh, a couple of times in last year, but there are also multiple other projects, multiple other mechanisms like people are trying to find out and not specifically tau. Like tau, tau is also like just one part of the huge umbrella, right? And there's a beta, there are other alpha cyanuclein, which is obviously not related to Alzheimer's disease, but any kind of like aggregated proteins can cause any kind of neurodegenerative disorder. So there are a lot of other stuffs, other researchers, researchers are going on. So yeah, definitely the success will lie once we get that uh, particular therapeutic agent. Absolutely, thank you for sharing. Um, Earlier in your introduction, we spoke a little bit about how you've really traveled the world and working in different <laughs> institutions and in different countries. Um, would love to hear more about your reflections on that journey. Um, I'm sure that there were definitely cultural differences from place to place. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, did you find that translate into the laboratory setting as well? Uh, laboratory setting, not much, but when I traveled in different countries, as you say, like there's so much cultural diversity, like for example, being in Singapore and being in Barcelona in Spain is like totally two polar ends, right? North and South Pole. And obviously there were language barriers, like in Spain, I need to know Spanish, otherwise I could not do a sim simple daily work, like even going to a bank or do a post office job, I need to know the language. So that was pretty difficult. But 
as long as you have that drive and motivation in yourself, like, no, I have to do it. I have come here for my PhD four years. No one is going to help me out. I need to know the language. I need to go out, talk to people, not just limit myself in the lab and just do experiments, right? You need a social life as well. So that's how, like, even at the age of 25 or 27, I learned a completely new language, Spanish. And I can speak a little bit of Catalan as well, which is their local dialect as well. So, yeah, so basically all this comes from your inner motivation. Like if you think, no, I have to do it no matter what, then obviously you can do it. But obviously it's challenging. It, it's not like something will happen overnight. But as long as you're focused enough, you can definitely succeed. Yeah, in terms of cultural difference, the thing now, since we have so much cultural diversity all over the world, like you will definitely, for example, find an Indian in an American lab setting. And so, or in Spain, you will definitely find out like a German or someone from Finland. So people are like, obviously COVID is a different thing. And now, oh, good thing like we are getting back to normal. But before COVID era, like since the culture and the travel, there were no travel restrictions and the students were eager to explore different parts of the world. So we always have this different uh, mixture of people coming from different nationalities. And that's actually a very good thing because if you have just people from one country, they tend to group together. They don't mix well with the other people, right? But if you have like multiple people from different countries, then obviously the lab moves also lift up, right? Because I still remember in my PhD time, every Friday we have this kind of like cultural parties, like, like a party from India, for example, a party from uh, Bangladesh or a party from any other country as well. So in that way, like people get to know you, your country, your culture, and what brings on the table as well. So that's actually very important. And it's actually the responsibility of the PI to maintain all those because so that no one should feel discriminated, right? Everyone has their own voice. Everyone should be given equal importance. It's not like, okay, if someone is American and he has the highest priority, that's absolutely not. Everyone is equal in their own right and uh, other things, right? So that was actually very important and we all enjoyed that very much. I think that's a really wonderful lab tradition to have as well. Just promote everyone to bring in that part of their identity and share. Yeah, it. yeah, really yeah, neat. definitely. And I still remember when we had those like soccer World Cups and all those, it was like <laughs> almost a fight between Spain and Italy or Spain and Portugal and all. But it was very, it, it actually relieves your stress, right? Because doing experiments, you know that you also worked at Barton Institute, right? It's like a high, high pressure environment, right? It's like always you have to think about uh, your research or whether it's working well or not, right? But something to relieve your stress, right? And that's actually critically important from, for mental health and all, yeah. On the note of finding that sort of supportive lab community, finding mentors who are really keen on hosting those kinds of supportive spaces, um, when you were looking during your PhD program, even later with your um, different job positions, how did you sort of gauge what kind of lab environment would be the best fit for you? So I think a lot of students, when they're searching for internships, are like, I don't mm -hmm. know what kind of style I want my PI's mentorship to be like. So do you have any tips on that process? Yeah, I would say like when looking for internship, obviously talk with the PIs, for example, research project. Like if you don't like your research project, then nothing will help, right? Like even going to the parties every Friday will not help, right? Because at the end of the day, you have to stay productive in the lab, generate enough data. And then of course, like Friday afternoon, you can do whatever you want throughout, want throughout the weekend, right? So research project is very important. So definitely reach out to, a, to your PI, like what, a uh, project you will be working on and not just a project, like whether there is a scope of publication. Like even you, you saw like in our uh, 2020 papers, like there will, you will, if you go into the PubMed and see all those papers, you will see a lot of students are involved in that. So even if you can generate one single data, so ask your PI, like whether it should be publishable or not, like whether I will get an authorship or not. So those are the critical questions. Like don't just do like work in a lab like a slave, right? Eight to eight kind of thing and help your postdocs or anything like that. And after that, they don't even acknowledge you. 
So those kind of things first you need to make sure, okay, I will be doing this project, I will be giving my 200%, I will try to generate enough data, but at the end, will you put me as an author in the manuscript or not? So those things are very critical scientific wise. And then of course, coming to the cultural aspect or not, try looking like lab pictures or photos, like where they do any kind of fun stuff or not. And what are the other people in the lab? Like look for the lab members, even reach out to them also. Like, hey, I have contacted your, uh, contacted your PI. Maybe I will join your lab as a summer intern. Can you tell me about lab environment? And then obviously they will be very free enough to tell you what's exactly going in the lab itself because PI will be mostly bound to his office, right? He will not, he or she will not know what exactly happened inside the laboratory setting. So you can reach out to those uh, scientists, staff scientists, postdocs, technicians, or even grad students and all like, how, what do you guys do like normally after lab or on a Friday or a weekend, do you guys hang out or not? Or is it like just people are just staying on their own? Like some labs, and remember my Singapore lab was very strict. Obviously it's like Singapore is a very strict country. Like they have, they do things very perfectly. And they're like people were very tend to be on about on themselves. Like they come to the morning, finish their stuff, go back home. They have no not much of social interaction, but which is completely all, uh, different from what was in Spain, right? Where people are very social, outgoing, and all. So definitely ask those questions as well, like whether you guys go outside, have a drink, or anything like that. Not not just like bound to your science, obviously. Science should be main priority, but definitely we need other aspects to have that fun factor going. Because if you don't have fun in your job or in your work, you will not feel that kind of motivation. You will not go that extra mind to achieve something. Thank you for sharing that. Definitely valuable advice um, for students just navigating that process. And I'm sure looking for even job opportunities later down the line and seeking that kind of an environment. Um, yeah. Tala has a question here. With cultural differences, do you think finding a cure for Alzheimer's might differ depending on the region on the patients? Maybe um, going line of like cultural perceptions for research and translating that? Yeah, that's a very interesting question. And I think Dr. Rego, I think highlighted that very much. And obviously he knows much better than me. So it's basically like the countries which has more higher priority or more have higher advantages, obviously they will run the show, right? Even other countries, like I should not call third world countries, but those are which are like little bit behind, they will obviously lack in terms of uh, any kind of cure on like, like what we have uh, saw in case of vaccine as well. Like I personally got vaccinated, like I think last year, December or January of this year, which was way early and my parents back in India, they just got vaccinated like the last month or so. So there's a huge gap in everything, right? Like it's like six to eight months gap lagging, which is not, we should not be there first of all. Like everyone, as I said, like everyone has equal rights and opportunities and we should make sure like everyone is treated equally. But obviously like in scientific scenario or real world scenario, this gap exists. So, in terms of finding a cure, for example, I don't know how much research is going on in, in those countries in, uh, back over there. I don't know whether they have like appropriate uh, settings to conduct this kind of high quality research, but definitely in terms of Europe or US or Canada, like obviously they are front runners. They have very big drug uh, screen platforms and all, like they're working nonstop to get any kind of uh, mechanistic insights to get into the mechanism in, uh, insights but obviously like once it's get done when there is a perfect drug magic pill that will be shared with the other countries but obviously in terms of priority who, whoever gets it first right maybe in india is happening we don't know maybe they can get it first as well we don't know but since just looking at the previous history and all like maybe us canada or europe or uh, scandinavian countries they will probably get it much earlier than the rest of the world, but obviously at some point, and that's more pharmaceutical aspect, like how all these logistics work out in terms of sharing drugs and all. Absolutely. It's really interesting to see how money and power, and especially kind of governmental agenda of like, do we prioritize this 
for our citizens yeah. really comes to play. Yeah, this is a very important point that you say, like prioritize, right? Like in our case in US, Alzheimer's disease is like a top priority disease because one of my very first slides I have shown like this, like millions of people are, and I think there's a statistics like it's like one in three people every minute or something like is getting affected with dementia, not Alzheimer's disease, dementia is like much bigger umbrella is uh, getting affected in US alone. So it's a top priority disease and that's why a lot of funding are going into this direction. And that's actually good for the students, like who, whoever is like, uh, want to do research in this field, feel free to reach out to the PIs who work on this disease because definitely they have funding to take new students or interns or any kind of small projects. So yeah, this is like, uh, I should not say a hot cake because obviously we are talking about a very devastating disease, but in terms of scientific research world, this is one of the top priority diseases that have been people are following on. Absolutely, absolutely. It's really interesting, maybe for folks who are thinking of commenting on the science policy route for their projects mm -hmm. for the hackathon, you may want to think about that as well as an extension of um, research beyond the lab and how there's so many different factors implicated there. Awesome, folks. Um, well, Dr. Gu is also our mentor for the hackathon. He will not be able to host a live mentorship session because he's a very busy person and this weekend is very busy. But if you have a question, you have any sort of brainstorming and progress about your project currently, and you would like to ask Dr. Guha for any advice or um, you know, related to the technicalities of the neurological condition, or more on his personal experiences with researching and applications, please feel free to ask. This is a great opportunity to take advantage of that. Yeah, sure. And also like you can follow me on Twitter and I'm also on LinkedIn, like many of you are in my LinkedIn connection as well. I see Arvind is there as well. So feel free to get connected over there. And once we are done over here, I will drop uh, my personal email address. So feel free to reach out in terms of like projects, looking for projects, how working in a laboratory setting looks like because it's completely different from uh, work like in a medical field. So I can tell you about that as well. Yeah, so feel free to reach out. And this connection is very important. So that's why I uh, clearly thank all the organizers over here like in back in our days like 10 years back we didn't have any of this platform but now what you are doing what you guys are doing is like absolutely fantastic it's like reaching out to the people reaching out to the senior professors uh, actual physician this is i think you all should take advantage of that because it will eventually help you in future like now Probably you guys are thinking, okay, this is a conference I'm attending, listening to people, but build connection, make more out of it. So I really thank uh, Chinmay, Arvind, Ria, and all the other people who are involved in this. Like you guys are doing a fantastic job, which yeah, we didn't you. have in our time. Absolutely, I really appreciate that. And it wouldn't be possible without the time of people like you. So a really big thank you to you once again. Um, sure. mm -hmm. Folks, if we don't have any other questions, we can probably wrap up, call it a day and let Dr. Guha enjoy the rest of his Friday. <laughs> sure, um, and I will just drop my email over here. Feel free to reach out anytime. Cool, thank you for having me here. Thank you so much. Yeah. Oh, I need to stop recording. <laughs>